I am obsessed with the lore of Dark Souls, Bloodborne, and Elden Ring in a way I've never been with any other series of games. I have probably spent hundreds of hours watching videos that dissect and analyze and theorize about so many tiny little details in these games, reading forums and discussions pouring through dozens of different fan theories. And I have spent hundreds of hours playing and replaying these games, rereading all the item descriptions, listening to all the dialogue, spent so much time thinking about the games and their stories even when I'm not playing them. I actually find these games to often be really frustrating to play, like some of these boss fights can just go screw themselves. But the world design and stories and characters are so fascinating that no matter how frustrated I get with the gameplay, I keep playing. I can't stop playing until I've not only seen everything in the game, but until I've seen it all like a dozen times. I've never been this obsessed with the story of any other video game. No other game's story has ever hooked me in quite the same way. And I know I'm not alone. There are millions of people who are just as obsessed, if not more obsessed than I am with the lore of these games. There are people who have made entire careers out of just talking about the lore from software games. That's crazy. That shouldn't be possible. There is something about the way the stories in these games are presented, something about the characters characters, the themes, the ideas, that is so compelling, so fascinating, that an entire cottage industry has arisen on the internet to dissect and discuss them. And it's something that is not easy to imitate. I've played a lot of games that are obviously trying to mimic the storytelling of Dark Souls, that try to tell stories that are esoteric and obscure and bleak, but just completely miss the mark, don't come anywhere close to getting their audiences as engaged as Dark Souls does. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this question. What is it about the lore of Dark Souls and Bloodborne and Elden Ring that makes us so obsessed with them? What do these stories have that all those imitators don't? And I think I've finally actually come up with an answer. I've narrowed it down to five specific elements in the world design. The first element of world design I want to discuss is what I'm calling layered history. Okay, so in Dark Souls, one of the first areas you'll explore is called the Undead Burg. And from there, you'll ascend to the undead parish and there you'll find this huge church and there's a lot of really interesting things going on here with the world design that i'll talk about more later in the essay but for now i just want to focus on how old this place feels the undead burg and undead parish feel ancient to me it feels like not only was this place constructed a really long time ago but that society collapsed here a really long time ago you do encounter some bits and pieces of the life that once thrived here. It's actually a very domestic setting in some ways. You will explore what look like ordinary homes and markets, but the people who once lived here are all long gone. In the present, this settlement is a haunted place inhabited only by hollowed mindless guards who are guarding nothing but ruins, and by warriors and adventurers whose journeys ended in pitiful failure, perhaps hundreds of years ago, yet their animated corpses continue to stalk the setting of their failure. When you explore here, you already get a sense that you're exploring ancient history. But from this big church, if you cross this walkway, you'll end up in a much smaller and much more ruined church. This is an even older church than the already ancient one we explored before. There is a story here. Once upon a time, this settlement grew too big and too prosperous for this cramped little church. So the people built that larger and more magnificent new church and then abandoned this one. This is a new layer of history that we've uncovered. Just like in real life, this land of Lordran is a place of deep history. Monuments constructed on top of other monuments, old stories written on the backs of even older stories. But it doesn't stop there. If you descend from the old church, you'll end up in this shadowy forest called the Dark Root Garden. And here you'll find even older ruins. These ruins are so old that there is nothing left of them except their crumbling foundations. These are so ruined and so decayed that you can't even tell what these buildings once were. If you explore really thoroughly, you'll even be able to rescue this time-traveling maiden from a crystal golem. This is Dusk, and she hails from a long-forgotten age, from a kingdom that was called Ulysseal, where magic utterly unlike the magic of the present once flourished. In her dialogue, you can get a glimpse of lost knowledge, forgotten ideas, a culture whose influence vanished from the world hundreds of years ago, 
The setting of Dark Souls, this land of the ancient lords, is a setting with a deep and layered history. You get this sense that with the passing of the ages, many different kingdoms and cultures have come and gone here, risen and fallen and been forgotten here. If you go deep enough, you can actually go all the way back to the beginning, all the way back to the Age of Ancients, the origins of this world before the rise of any kingdoms, before the rise of anything at all. Down, down, down in Ash Lake, the deepest part of the map, you can catch a glimpse of what this world looked like at the beginning. This is something that I absolutely love about exploring the world of Dark Souls. I love delving deeper and deeper and deeper into history, and you're always rewarded for going deeper. You'll always find something even more mysterious, more incredible. And this isn't unique to Dark Souls. All of the From Software Souls and Souls adjacent games do this. For example, you can find the exact same layering of history in Blood Bloodborne. At the start of Bloodborne, you'll explore central Yarnum, the urban center of this strange Victorian-inspired city, a place gripped by a fanatic religion which worships blood and dark gods, a place which is currently in its death throes, overcome by a plague which transforms humans into beastly monsters. Yarnum is a cramped city of twisting streets and dark alleys and misty graveyards, where hundreds of cathedral spires compete for space in a cluttered and choked skyline. Yarnum is my absolute favorite setting in any From Software game. I love this place. As you explore, you can discover a hidden path leading down below central Yarnum, and here you'll enter a place called Old Yarnum, an older district of the city constructed down in a river valley. The architecture here is much simpler and cruder and blockier than the incredibly ornate architecture up above. Old Yarnum was built in a poorer time, and perhaps a time before the city was gripped by its current blood-obsessed religion. But Old Yarnum was once overwhelmed by the same beast plague that is now ravaging central Yarnum. This district was burned to stop the plague, and both beastly and still human residents were burned along with it. It is an abandoned place where only beasts now dwell, long forgotten by the rest of the city. And you can go even deeper than this. Old Yarnum was built atop the site of a vast underground labyrinth. Tombs and caverns, an entire ancient underground city carved out by the Thumerians, a race of pale superhumans guardians and caretakers of sleeping gods. And even the labyrinth has layers of history of its own. The earliest Thumerians were mere humble guardians, but later generations built entire grand kingdoms beneath the earth, with a nobility and aristocracy, and their queens intermarried with restless gods. Just like Dark Souls, Bloodborne's setting has these layers of history that keep going down and down seemingly without end, more and more ancient, stranger and stranger, each layer more mysterious than the one above. Elden Ring has some of this too. Elden Ring is set in a kingdom called the Lands Between. In the present, the Lands Between are dominated by the God Queen Merica and the Golden Order she founded. But everywhere you look, you can find evidence of older, previous orders that once dominated this place, of a chaotic, primordial crucible and dragon gods, of sorceress astrologers who once read the future and the movements of the stars, and of the Nox, a condemned people who conspired against the gods themselves, and of the gruesome godskin apostles who worshipped a figure known as the Gloam-Eyed Queen. There is so much history in the lands between that is way older than the already very old history of Queen Merica in the Golden Order. But most of it is so ancient and so forgotten that all you can find are these tantalizing little bits and pieces, hints of a much larger story. This is something that a lot of Dark Souls imitators are missing. They'll have ancient settings full of ruins, but you'll only ever get to uncover that one surface layer of history. And maybe it is a compelling history, but it can never be as fascinating as the deep history of the Souls games. Never as fascinating as getting to peel back layer after layer of history, delving all the way down to the origin of the 
the world, the births of the gods passing lost kingdoms and forgotten cultures on your descent. The settings of Dark Souls and Bloodborne and Elden Ring feel so old. Their histories are so complicated and layered and mysterious. You're not just unraveling one thread of history, you're unraveling age upon age upon age of historical threads, built on top of each other, inspiring and influencing each other. But what is even more important than those layers is the fact that we, the player, uncover those layers ourselves. That is another essential element of the world building in these games. In Souls, instead of just being told the history of the setting, you have to go out and find it. A lot of fantasy RPG series do have settings with long and complicated histories. Elder Scrolls, The Witcher, Baldur's Gate. All of these series have kingdoms that have risen and fallen, champions that have been transformed into mythological heroes by the passing of the ages, world-shattering wars whose scars form the bedrock of new thriving civilizations. All of these series and many others have really cool lore, but it has never hooked me in quite the same way that Dark Souls has. In a lot of other fantasy RPGs, the history of the setting will be told to you in a very direct and straightforward manner. A lot of it will come through extensive dialogue with other characters. Characters will tell you absolutely everything they know about the history of their worlds. These games will have literally hundreds of pages worth of dialogue, and a lot of that will be made up of characters talking about the history of their kingdoms, of their heroes, of their cultures, of their religious beliefs, just telling you everything you could ever want to know about the lore of their respective games. But as cool as these stories can be, I don't think a story told this way, through pages and pages of explicit exposition, can ever be as compelling compelling as a story told the way from software's games do, through player-controlled discovery. In Bloodborne, when you take your first steps out into the twisted city of Yharnam, you will know absolutely nothing about this setting or its history. You will wander around, lost and confused. Slowly, you will begin to understand the setting through its visual design, through little snippets of dialogue from characters who never tell you everything they know from item descriptions that reveal small pieces of culture and history. Eventually, you will find the path down to Old Yarnum completely on your own. No one will tell you where this entrance is. No one will ever tell you the history of this older, burned, and forgotten district of the city. You have to put the pieces together on your own. You have to examine the simpler architecture here and realize, oh, this is simpler and cruder because it is older. You have to find a note that mentions the burning of Old Yarnum. You have to find hidden items and read hints in their descriptions. And then you have to descend down into the underground labyrinth, figure out for yourself what its connection to the city above is, how the layers of history here link together. There is no character or history book that will just straight up tell you, okay, in the beginning there were these powerful godlike beings who ascended into a dream world, leaving their bodies behind down in this labyrinth tomb, and they also left behind these guardians called Thumerians to watch over their sleeping bodies in the tombs. Then over the course of time, those Thumerians developed their own culture and nobility and society, but they screwed things up when their last queen porked a dark god named Odin, and her freaky godchild miscarried, but also lived on in some kind of crazy undead god way, unable to control its own undead powers, screwing everything up. And then some of the Thumerians fled above ground where they intermarried with some humans up there, founded the Kanehurst royal bloodline, ruled over this land as feudal lords for a while, built up Old Yarnum in the River Valley, then some scholars at the nearby Bergenworth College rediscovered the underground labyrinth tomb. They explored, unearthed the ancient Thumerian practice of blood healing. One of them, Lawrence, shared this practice around. Then he himself transformed into a monster, then was beheaded. And then a new healing church was founded in his name, etc, etc. The layers of history build on top of each other. On and on and on, up and up and up. In any other fantasy RPG, those things would just be told to you, but not in a Souls game. Another really smart thing that the Souls games do is attach a lot of the story to item descriptions. Every single item description in the game will include at least one small detail about the setting's history or some character's story. This way, players aren't just searching for new items, but are also very literally searching for the lore. The more thoroughly you explore, the more details of the story you are rewarded with. 
if you're someone who is obsessed with the lore of these games, it's a really strong incentive to keep playing, to search every nook and cranny, to go places and try things you wouldn't otherwise. For me, the most fun part of the gameplay of this series isn't the action or the boss battles. It's getting to feel like I'm an explorer, a treasure hunter, even a sort of archaeologist, uncovering the ancient history of all these incredible places. When you uncover enough details, you can begin to identify each of those layers of history, understand the major events, figure out how they connect to each other. This requires analysis, interpretation, even imagination. You have to be somewhat creative in the ways you fill in the holes, because there are so many holes. The Souls games never provide you with the complete picture. Even if you find every line of dialogue, every item description, examine every visual detail in the environment, you still will not have a complete picture of the story. There are missing pieces. Some of those missing pieces can be filled in by making educated guesses based on the pieces we do have. Like no one in Bloodborne ever actually says why the Thumerian civilization collapsed. But we do know that in some kind of crazy ritual, they gave birth to a destructive, undead, miscarried infant god, so hey, that seems like a definite possible culprit. I can put those two pieces together on my own. But the really crazy thing about the Souls games is that some of those missing pieces, even a lot of those missing pieces, are completely and totally unknowable. Fans can theorize, we can make guesses, but we'll never actually know. And that's not a mistake, that's by design. This is another one of those brilliant elements of world design that set the Souls lore apart from all other games. Unknowability. Now, a lot of people are frustrated by unknowability in fiction. Questions that are not only never answered by the author, but questions that the author intentionally crafted to be impossible to answer. It's like if you read a murder mystery and when you got to the end of the book, the author never revealed who the murderer was. A lot of audiences get frustrated by that kind of unsolvable mystery in their stories. Audiences don't like not having all the answers. They don't enjoy feeling like the author is withholding answers from them. They are unsatisfied with that kind of story's conclusion. Sometimes I see people express a similar frustration with the Souls games. We just want more information. Like how the heck is it possible that Queen America and Radigan are the same person? How did they have children together? How can they work at completely cross purposes while inhabiting the same body? It doesn't make any sense. However, there is a whole genre of fiction, a genre which has been dramatically rising in popularity in recent years, called weird fiction. And unknowability is a central element of weird fiction. Unknowable knowledge was all over the place in the fiction of H.P. Lovecraft. His characters were always dealing with forbidden knowledge, where it was like, if you even could learn this, it would break your freaking mind, dude. It would destroy your fragile little psyche. Knowledge of this would leave you a gibbering madman. The exact nature of that knowledge was never revealed in his stories. The whole point was that it couldn't be revealed. It was knowledge beyond human comprehension. It couldn't even be written down with human language. I've always loved this aspect of weird fiction because I think it matches our true lived experience of the universe. As a human being living on Earth in the 21st century, there is a vast and discomforting number of questions for which you will probably never ever have an answer that perhaps can never be known. And some of these are very simple questions like, why is there anything in instead of nothing. What is reality? What is God? What is a soul? What is consciousness? What is time? These are basic questions, people. It's not just frustrating not having satisfying and complete answers to these fundamental questions of the universe. It can actually be kind of anxiety-inducing, unsettling to think about how little we actually know about the basics of our reality and our perception of that reality. The unknowability of weird fiction taps into that anxiety Anxiety, weaves it into our stories, and I think the Souls games actually tap into the same kind of thing. All of the Souls games are heavily inspired by weird fiction. These games are weird. Like, Queen America is weird, dude. These giant, magical, slowly rotting fingers, which commune with an outer god through digit vibrations, are freaking weird. The spreading rot blossoming new alien life within the body of Melania, a cursed blessing from a different outer god of unclear or perhaps incomprehensible motivations, that's weird too. 
All of this is weird. All of these plot threads and characters involve unknowable mysteries, unanswerable questions. Like where the heck did these giant fingers come from? When and how did they split off from these three other giant fingers? Why do these fingers simp so hard for the Golden Order? And why do these fingers want to burn the universe down to a primordial state of lifeless chaos? What is going on here? But let's get back to the original question of this essay, which was, why are we so obsessed with the lore of the Souls games? Unknowability is a big part of the answer. Humans are so driven by curiosity. We are not satisfied with, well, they're just isn't an answer to this mystery. We will never stop searching for that answer, not until we find some satisfying explanation, even if we have to make up that explanation ourselves. That's part of why people get so obsessed with the lore of the Souls games, because there are all these questions without satisfying answers, and so fans keep playing and replaying, re-listening to the dialogue, re-reading item descriptions, making new connections, discussing it together on forums, making hour-long video essays, all to find some satisfying explanation. And From Software is so brilliant, because they almost always include just enough details, just enough pieces of the puzzle to let the player get started, just enough pieces for us to create our own explanations. In this way, the audience becomes an active part of the storytelling process. We tell as much of the story ourselves as the writers do. But let's rewind here. Let's go all the way back to the Undead Berg area in Dark Souls, because there are some really weird details in the environment here that demonstrate another essential element of Souls world design. On the surface, the Undead Berg looks like a pretty familiar place. It looks really similar to a lot of other medieval fantasy settings. You've got characters in chainmail and iron armor, wielding swords and shields and crossbows. Bows. You can see stone castle walls, cobblestone streets, little houses full of crude wooden furniture. You can find cathedrals and ramparts and dragons and thieves and merchants. A lot of things you would expect to find in a setting like this one. But on a closer look, it very quickly becomes clear how different the Undead Burg is from any other medieval fantasy setting. Because from a practical standpoint, if we're expected to believe that people actually lived ordinary lives in this place at some point, the Undead Burg doesn't make any sense at all. Its physical layout is completely insane. The Undead Burg was constructed hundreds of feet in the air on a series of massive castle ramparts and walls, defensive structures that don't appear to be defending anything or have any purpose at all, that end in seemingly random spots. The Undead Berg streets are crooked and contorted, twisted around on top of and underneath each other in bizarre and bewildering ways. If you were just a regular person, life would be very difficult here. Transportation would be nearly impossible, just getting around would be confusing and dangerous dangerous, even if there weren't any monsters around. There is no natural water source anywhere nearby, nowhere to grow or hunt or forage for food. Yarnum, the Victorian-inspired urban setting of Bloodborne, has a lot of similar peculiarities. Once again, on the surface, this is a familiar setting. It looks like a lot of other Victorian settings and a lot of other video games. But just like with the Undead Berg, as soon as you start to explore, things start getting weird. Once again, the physical layout is crooked and contorted, with streets twisted around on top of each other in confusing ways. There are odd little details like seemingly ancient gravestones that are completely blocking much newer doorways. Did someone build a house in front of an old gravestone in such a way that it is impossible to open the front door? Or did they haul this old gravestone from somewhere else and intentionally block their own door with it? And the big details are even stranger. Yarnum as a city simply would not not function. I cannot find any evidence anywhere of any commercial or industrial infrastructure anywhere in this city. Where are all of these firearms and carriages and clothing etc manufactured in this city? Where are they sold? Where is the food gathered and prepared? Where is the food sold or served? Where are all the hundreds of thousands of gallons of water that would be necessary to keep a city of this size alive? Every single well and fountain are dried up and appear to have been dry for decades. The canals are all dried up too. 
Yarnum is a bizarre city made up exclusively of residential buildings packed tightly together with innumerable cathedrals, most of which don't appear to serve any specific religious purpose. There are all these pointless cathedrals, which appear to have been built just for the sake of having one more cathedral in a city which already has way more cathedrals than anyone could ever possibly need. It doesn't make any sense. How would this city ever function as an actual city, like as a place where people actually live? You can find examples like these in every Souls games, settings that look normal on the outside, but as soon as you take a closer look, they just don't make any sense at all. Sometimes I've seen people criticize this style of world design. They call it a mistake, but it's only a mistake if the developers were actually attempting to create a setting that made practical real world sense in in the first place. And I don't think that's what From Software was ever trying to do. From Software doesn't create real world settings, they create unreal settings. They don't create literal settings, instead they create thematic settings. And what I mean by that is that they create settings which are meant to convey a theme or an idea or a feeling or an atmosphere rather than a setting that's actually practical or sensible. For example, in the Undead Burg, all those weird megalithic concentric defensive walls that don't look like they're defending anything aren't even meant to be literally defending anything. Instead, they are meant to convey this idea of strength and power. The thicker your castle walls are and the more of them you have, the more powerful you are. And Lordran is the site of great power. All of those seemingly purposeless cathedrals in Yarnum, which don't appear to be practical sites of religious worship, they are meant to convey an idea of a city's population that has been gripped by a fanatical religion, that has become such an overwhelming presence in their lives that it dominates everything, becomes cluttered and claustrophobic. This fanatical religion has actually choked all life in the city, and you can see that visually in the physical design of the city. Another interesting example is down in Old Yarnum. I've already talked a little bit about how Old Yarnum was burned down to prevent the spread of the Beast Plague. However, everything in the lore, all of the dialogue and clues, strongly suggest that this burning happened a long time ago, years ago, decades ago, maybe even longer than that. However, when you explore Old Yarnum, it's still burning. There are still fires here, still corpses smoking. That doesn't make any sense from a literal sense, but it does make sense if you assume the developers are working thematically. These still burning fires aren't meant to be taken seriously, but instead are meant to convey the idea of burning, of disaster, of the extremes the hunters were willing to go to to protect the rest of the city from the beast plague. You always have to be careful when you're examining small details in the settings of these games. You should always ask yourself, is this meant to be a literal detail or is this more of a thematic detail? There is a tension between what these settings look like and how they actually function. I call this tension unreality because it makes the worlds of these games feel sort of unreal and it's the fourth essential world design element I want to examine in this essay. This sense of unreality isn't limited to just the physical settings of the games. Unreality extends deep into the stories as well. These games look like they're set in a normal Earth-like world where both physics and spirituality work the same way as they do in our world. But just like the way the Undead Berg looks like a normal medieval setting but actually isn't, neither are the stories. Okay, so let me explain what I mean. In Dark Souls, there's a lot of talk about humanity. Item descriptions and characters are constantly talking about humanity this and humanity that. Now, in any other story, the word humanity would mean something pretty simple. It would just refer to the human race. But that's not quite what the word means in Dark Souls. In Dark Souls, the term humanity specifically refers to this literally dark soul that exists within all members of the human race of this world. A mysterious dark soul which exists alongside their normal soul. Unraveling the mystery of this extra soul, this so-called humanity, is central to unraveling all the mysteries of this fictional world. How it functions at a very basic level. Another example might be Godhood in Elden Ring. When characters talk about Godhood in this game, I don't think they quite mean the same thing as when that word is used in other stories. Everyone constantly talks about how Queen Merica is a full-blooded real 
god, a being of tremendous power, but we never actually see that power in the game. Instead, we see a Queen Merica who has been captured and confined, who appears nearly powerless. Apparently, Queen Merica wasn't always a god, but we have no clue how she became one. There are other characters who are said to have the potential to become new gods, but it's never explained what those godly criteria are, except that it definitely requires the influence of something called an outer god, a being even stranger and even more powerful. Just like with humanity in Dark Souls, Souls. Unraveling the mystery of godhood in Elden Ring is central to unraveling everything. The Souls games use ideas that on the surface initially seem like they're being used in the same familiar way as they are used in other fantasy settings. Humanity, godhood. But once you delve into the lore, you will discover that these familiar terms are being used to describe something completely alien and foreign and new. That's unreality in both the story and in the world building. I think this sense of unreality is a big reason why we get so obsessed with the lore of these games. The setting and the stories and the ideas are all familiar, but we can sense that something is off, something is different here. There's an uncanny valley effect that covers every aspect of the design, from the visuals to the stories themselves. One of the reasons why I love the city of Yarnum so much is because it doesn't feel like a real place. Exploring Yarnum feels like I'm exploring a dream world, a dark reflection of our own world, where people cannot live ordinary lives, so they must live extraordinary lives here. That's the kind of setting I want to spend a lot of time in. If From Software fixed Yarnum to be more like a practical city, I don't think I would be as interested. And I think this is one of the hardest elements of Souls world design for copycats to imitate. This is something that a lot of Souls-like games are missing, and that's not surprising to me. A couple games do nail it, like Blasphemous and Hollow Knight are two games that I think do a fantastic job of recreating this sense of unreality, and doing it in very different ways too. But most Souls-like games don't even come close. I think it's probably really hard to create a setting that looks familiar on the surface, but underneath functions in a totally different and unique way. It's an impressive feat of world design, and something I think deserves to receive more attention from fans. Souls games show us things we've never seen before in a fantasy setting, just so long as we're willing to dig underneath that seemingly ordinary surface. Now, to end this video, I want to discuss one final essential element to Souls world design, and this one is a lot simpler than the last couple, but still just as important. I call this last element hostility and hope which are two ideas that are closely tied together in these games. Let's start with hostility. The settings of these games are intensely hostile places. Everything is trying to kill you. There are so few safe havens, so few friendly faces here compared to other fantasy RPGs. It feels like everything and everyone you meet wants to kill you. There is no diplomacy in these settings, no compromise. You can never talk or trick your way through any obstacle. The these are kill or be killed worlds. It is vicious. I think this is part of why players tend to become so attached to the few friendly characters who do exist. And this hostility extends beyond just the monsters. The setting itself is physically hostile to the player. I've already talked some about how twisting and convoluted and confusing the layouts of the Undead Berg and Central Yarnum are. Well, a lot of these twists and turns are actually designed to kill you. You're supposed to get tricked by animals ambushes, trapped in impossible fights, get thrown off walkways. The world itself is designed to kill you. And this extends into the lore as well. In Dark Souls, your player character is a hollow, a bearer of the dark sign, a cursed and wretched creature hated by all human kingdoms. In this world, hollows are hunted, killed, burned, tortured, imprisoned, and all of this is tied to that mystery of humanity, that dark extra soul, because everything in these stories is connected together. In Bloodborne, Yarnum is a deeply xenophobic society. In your character, character is a foreigner. The people of Yarnum hate you, mock you, bar you from safe havens, hide important knowledge from you, even hunt and kill you just for being an outsider. In Elden Ring, not only are you a member of a condemned people, stripped of their godly blessings, exiled from your homeland for an unnamed sin, hated and spurned by the denizens of the lands between, but even among your kind, you are lesser. As the very first NPC you meet points out, you are made 
maidenless. You are friendless. You have no guide and no companions. The monsters of these games want you dead. The world itself wants you dead. And even the story wants you dead. And not just you. The story wants all of the characters you meet dead too. The story is constantly killing off likable characters in miserable and heartbreaking ways. This is one of the easiest world design elements for Souls-like games to imitate. Just fill your video game world up with monsters, craft a level design that's hard to navigate, full of ambushes and traps, make the player character be born of some wretched and hated lineage, kill off all the nice characters over the course of the story, and bam, there you go. Souls-likes are usually really good at crafting their own hostile worlds, but they're often missing something else. The Souls settings are really bleak and depressing places, where almost nothing ever works out for anyone. Everyone you like dies, everything is terrible, except these settings are not hopeless. There are these faint little slivers of hope to be found in these settings. Let's start with some of the characters. In all of these games, there are characters who are so kind-hearted, so compassionate, who just want to help. I haven't talked about Demon Souls yet in this video, but one of my all-time favorite characters in any of these games is Stockpile Thomas. This man who fled his home before the March of the Demon Fog, and abandoned his wife and child in the process. Thomas feels such deep guilt and shame for his failure, but he treats the player character so kindly in a world where everything else hates you. He's trying so hard to be useful, to make up for his past mistakes in some small way. I love this guy, he's such a minor character, but so well written and so likable. In Bloodborne, there is this beggar. He is a hideous character. His body is twisted and gray-colored. He looks like a monster, but that monstrous appearance is hiding a kind heart. This beggar, who has probably lived a very hard life, who has been cast out of society, derided and scorned, has created a safe haven, a place where people can survive the ravages of the beast plague. And he does it for no reason other than that he wants to help. He wants to save lives. He even saves people who continue to treat him like crap after being saved. And he expresses no resentment towards them. He's practically a saint. In Dark Souls, you even have outright silly goofball characters. Like Siegmeier of Katarina, this optimistic and upbeat but sort of oafish warrior who constantly gets trapped or stuck and can only progress with the help of the player. He's not trying to accomplish anything grand here in Lordran. He just wants to go on a fun adventure, wants to see how far he can go. These little slivers of goodness and kindness are so important. These games would be so miserable without characters like Stockpile Thomas or The Beggar or Siegmeier. They would be bleak and hopeless settings without any light or fun or anything to fight for. And I do think this sliver of hope extends all throughout the lore too. As horrific as their histories are, as poorly as things are going in the present, there is a sense in these games that things could be made better. That you, the player, could have a positive impact on these worlds. For example, Elden Ring's story ultimately becomes all about finding ways to fix or enhance or even replace the grievous and authoritarian rule of the Golden Order. Throughout the game, you see all these terrible things the Golden Order has done, all these terrible ways that innocent people have been treated under this rule. But you are given several options with which to repair that order, to make it fairer, or to even cast the whole thing aside and build something new in its place. Elden Ring is ultimately a hopeful story about repairing a broken world. And this is something that I think a lot of Souls-likes are missing. They do a great job of imitating the bleakness and the misery and the hostility, but they're missing the lightness, the kindness, the silliness, and the hope. The Souls games are famous for their depressing story, but it's actually the often overlooked glimmers of hope that make them truly great stories. So there it is, those are the five elements of world design that I think explain what makes us so obsessed with Souls lore. Layered history, player-driven discovery, unknowability, unreality, and hostility mixed with hope. In these games we explore ancient settings with deep layers of history, and we discover those layers on our own, by our own volition. Those layers are full of unknowable mysteries that drive us to keep searching through medieval kingdoms and Victorian cities that never feel quite Quite real, hostile settings that are trying to kill us, but which at their cores hide these little glimmers of hope. 
Through this combination of elements, From Software has crafted some of the most compelling and most fascinating settings anywhere in video games. Settings which I will never get tired of returning to. This was a really fun essay for me to write. I love the stories of the Souls games and I love talking about them. I don't know if anyone else still cares about the lore of older games like Dark Souls and Bloodborne anymore, but I do and I think I'm going to keep making more videos about them. One thing I didn't talk about much in this essay is that every single Souls game is set in a post-apocalyptic world. All of these games are set in dead worlds that have been devastated by disaster and catastrophe. I think the next Souls essay I write will be focused on that. Why are the writers at From Software so attracted to that kind of post-apocalyptic setting? Why are we as players attracted to it? What effect does it have on the story? What narrative themes can you explore in this sort of setting? What are its limitations? But those are questions for another time and another video. A question I want to ask right now is, which imitators, which souls likes, actually managed to nail all of these essential elements of world design. The one that jumps to mind for me is always Hollow Knight. Hollow Knight doesn't really play at all like a Souls game, but its world design really reminds me of Dark Souls, and I think you can easily find all five of these elements in its design. Blasphemous comes pretty close. It definitely has a setting that feels unreal, and is full of unknowable mysteries that you discover on your own, but I'm not sure if it has a layered history or very much in the way of hope. I don't think a lot of popular Souls likes, like The Surge or Lords of the Fallen or even Neo, have many of these elements, which is why despite being pretty good games, I've never really been hooked by any of them. Armored Core 6 just came out, the first new Armored Core game in like a decade. Obviously, we all know that the gameplay is mechanically completely different than the Souls games, but what I'm curious about is, will it have the world design of a Souls game? Will it have the story of a Souls game wrapped in a different gameplay package? Does the planet Rubicon have a layered history? Do you have to discover that history on your own? Does that world include unknowable mysteries? Does it feel sort of unreal? Does it contain themes of both hostility and hope? I genuinely would be curious to know what other games people think feature some of these same elements of world design. If you can think of any, please do share them with me. There's nothing I love more in video games than finding a new, fascinating world to explore.